I've discovered it at last. At least I've discovered where they melt it down for the making of gold leaf. Gold granules are placed in a crucible. Then it goes into the furnace. The gold melts and the precious liquid is poured into a mold. After cooling, a solid bar of gold or ingot weighing 150 ounces emerges. On this machine, the bar is rolled out to a hundredth part of its original thickness. The roller is exerting a terrific pressure. Then a second roller. This reduces the thickness to two thousandths of an inch, the gold emerging in the form of a delicate ribbon. The ribbon is cut into squares each square going into a book of parchment leaves. The gold-beating machine sets to work, and in half an hour, the leaf is pounded to an eighth of its already flimsy thinness. The machine can do no more. Only human effort can beat the gold to a yet thinner leaf. The leaf is placed between very fine ox skins, and beating begins. This is a highly skilled labor, clever wrist work being required more than actual strength. Many years of experience are necessary before one becomes an expert gold beater. Still the beating goes on. The leaves are quartered and placed between still finer skin and beaten again. This time for five and a half hours. After this long process, the leaf begins to acquire the right degree of thinness, about 250 thousandths of an inch. See how years of beating have worn the handle of the hammer to the beater's grip. Girls cut the gold leaf into the required size using wooden knives for this highly specialized work. The finished leaves of gold are set up into small books of soft paper, ready for all kinds of ornamentation. See how the gold leaf is raised by blowing. This also removes the surplus fragments from the edges. But you mustn't think that this part is wasted. Oh no, it's far too precious. The gold waste is carefully gathered together and then back it goes into the furnace to be remelted for molding into new leaf but we shall have to turn over a new leaf if we want to be in time to see this unusual sight. This is just an impression of the early morning wash and brush up which every railway engine undergoes. Just part of the routine in readiness for a non-stop performance. But as you will see with all the makeup, massage and beauty cream, it takes more than one assistant. Thus, glamour is added to the monarchs of the rail, gleaming locomotives, the symbol of modern achievement. For the present, we leave them turning to a fascinating link with the past, horse troughs. And here we find perhaps one of the most unusual jobs, census taking for the Drinking Fountain and Cattle Trough Association. Mr. Anthony does this original work. He takes statistics of the number of horses drinking from the numerous troughs. His figures reveal some surprising facts too. In one of the most crowded parts, as many as 600 horses stop for a drink between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. London loves its horses, and looks after them as much as it loves its gardens and parks, especially when the flower beds are aglow with rhododendron blossoms. Equally charming are the flowers and rare shrubs to be found in this garden. Oh, we won't deceive you. It's all in miniature, and it's the work of Anne Ashbery, well known for her wonderfully realistic miniature gardens. We discover Miss Ashbery tending one of her gardens. This, so to speak, is a bird's eye view. She selects a few tiny plants. Then, the minute gardening tools. It all seems casual, but actually she's working to a set plan, requiring the greatest attention to detail. Now we shall see her at work. The first plant is a flowering shrub of diminutive dimensions. Then a tiny columbine or dancing fairy flower. A miniature iris from North America. But have you ever seen a daffodil as tiny as this? It comes from the Pyrenees. A few little rocks complete the scheme. Compare the size of a normal daffodil with the one in Miss Ashbury's little garden. Miss Ashbury's pride, fully grown rose trees. 
Her miniatures contain many delightful plants, familiar on a larger scale in most English gardens. But like Peter Pan, they never grow up and provide just enough gardening pleasure without making it a burden. But we have another pleasure in store, being privileged to watch Frank Slater as he sketches a portrait of Hildegard, famous international stage and radio star. I can see by the way you're posing, Miss Hildegard, this isn't the first time you've sat to an artist. No, it is not. You see, I lived in Paris for two years. And while I was there, I sat for Russian, German, French, and Italian painters. But you are the first Englishman, Mr. Slater. You sing in several languages, I believe, Miss Hildegard, don't you? I sing in Russian, French, and uh, German. And I'm also studying Swedish songs. You see, it was while I was in Little K, France, that I had an engagement to go back to England. And while in London, I sang for the occasion of the wedding of the Duke and Duchess of Kent, and then also other royal functions, like the birth of their little son, Prince Edward, the Jubilee, and also the coronation. That's lovely. Oh, Mr. Slater, it's getting awfully warm. May I take off my jacket? Well, by all means, let oh, me help you. Thank you. Oh, that is much better. It is thank rather you warm, so isn't much. it? By the way, how is it getting on? Oh, rather well, I think. You know, I'm terribly interested in art. When I was quite young, they told me I had great talent for drawing and painting. Now tell me, has anything particularly amusing happened to you in your own work recently? Well, let me see. Oh yes, I do recall something very funny and amusing. It was my opening night in Brussels, and I was bowing very graciously and thanking my people. And all of a sudden, I, I fell right down on the shiny floor, right down, boom, just like that. <laughs> that must have been a bit upsetting. Oh, upsetting is the word. But I didn't lose my head. I just got up and uh, I patted the spot that uh, didn't feel so good. And I said, oh la la, ça fait mal, n'est-ce pas? And everybody laughed and I laughed it off too. But I have a soft spot in my heart for the English audiences. After all, I built up my reputation here. And everybody has been so kind to me. I think it's nearly finished now. Would you like to come and have a look at it? Oh, is it? I'd love to, thank you. Oh, but that is lovely, Mr. Slater. But it is far too beautiful for me. Oh, nonsense. You look at yourself in the mirror. Oh, you flatter. <laughs>